Hello, my name's Sarah. Hi, my name's Andy. Today we're going to explain why laboratory testing is so useful for understanding diseases, how testing has changed over the years and what the future might hold. We work in the laboratories at the Nuffield Department of Population Health, University of Oxford. Our department conducts world-leading research into the causes, prevention and treatment of diseases. We study populations around the world to understand the causes of diseases such as heart disease, cancer and diabetes. In our laboratory, we store and test millions of blood and urine samples to understand the causes of diseases and monitor the effects of treatments for them. And blood and urine measurements are really useful for population health because they contain so much information. They can help us understand the, the effects of diet, hormones, infections, genetics and much more on diseases. And most tests just need a drop of blood to get a result. These measurements are also really useful because they're objective measurements, so they don't rely on someone's answers to a questionnaire. For example, if I asked you how much chocolate you ate last week, you might not want to give us the correct result and you might underestimate it. Whereas if we could test for this in your blood, we'd get the right result. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about blood in general. The first question is, is how much blood is in the average person? Is it five litres? Two and a half litres? 500 mil? Or 10 mil? The answer is five litres. Okay. If you went to the hospital and donated blood, how much are you allowed to take, or how much are they allowed to take even? Is it, again, two, five litres, two and a half litres, 500 mil, or the 10 mils? They're allowed to take 500 mil in any one time, and you get a biscuit for it. When you come to our studies, and you donate blood for one of those, how much are we allowed to take from you? Again, is it five litres, two and a half litres, 500 mil, or 10 mils? It's only 10 mils. If you're lucky, you might get a biscuit, but it's only 10 mils. So let's take a closer look at blood. This is what it would look like if it was magnified. So the red cells contain haemoglobin and carry oxygen around the body. The white cells contain DNA and help fight infection. These very small little balls are platelets, which help your blood to clot if you cut yourself. And this yellow liquid is called plasma and it mostly contains water. There are various ways of testing blood depending on what you want to measure. But most of our tests are done on the plasma. So to get the plasma, we need to spin or centrifuge the blood. When we do this, the red cells and the white cells fall to the bottom and we're left with the plasma on the top. And we take this plasma off for testing. So I'll now hand over to Andy, who will talk about blood collection and how testing was done years ago. One of the things that we look for, or one of the things we research, is heart disease. One of the main contributors to heart disease is something called cholesterol. Okay? Cholesterol is a fatty substance that's found naturally in the body. Okay? It's produced by the liver, and we have to have some amount of cholesterol in our bodies, but if you have too much cholesterol, right, that's bad for you. As the cholesterol is raised, it starts, the cholesterol starts to block your arteries, so the blood starts to struggle to flow through it. And when that happens, that's the beginnings of the causes of heart disease and strokes. Okay. Cholesterol was first discovered and reported in the 1950s after the US President Franklin D. Roosevelt died of a stroke and a heart attack at a really young age. Cholesterol testing in the 1950s was a long, slow process. It was done by hand. It took three hours and it took, one and a, it took half a mil of our very precious sample. So what would happen is, is the person would come along, they would take your 10 mil sample, put it in a centrifuge, spin it, take half a mil of that plasma, add various chemicals to it, and you'd end up with a colour change reaction, much like this one. So here you'd have your sample, and then you'd add the other chemical to it, and it would go from one colour 
to a different colour. The change in colour, the more of that colour, the more cholesterol is in the body. Okay? It's not the most accurate of tests, and it took an awful long time. However, as time's gone on, technology's improved. The analyzers that we use in the lab use, do cholesterol testing in 10 minutes and use two microliters of plasma. One microliter is a thousandth of a milliliter, so it uses much, much less. To give an idea is, you might not be able to see it, there's a tiny red blob in the bottom of that tube. That's the amount that it takes. So what we've discovered over the years is that yes, having a high cholesterol level can be bad for your health. But what we were measuring was actually total cholesterol. And cholesterol is actually carried around in the blood in particles called lipoproteins. There are several different types and they're not all bad guys. So I've got some models of lipoproteins here. They're all different sizes, but they all have cholesterol in their core and they have different particles on the surface which determines how they behave and what jobs they do. So two key lipoproteins are low-density lipoprotein, or LDL for short, and high-density lipoprotein, or HDL for short. So low-density lipoprotein has, as I said, cholesterol in its core, and it has this protein wrapped around its surface called apolipoprotein B. LDL is sometimes also known as bad cholesterol. It transports cholesterol from the liver to the cells. And if you have a high level of LDL in the blood, it can deposit cholesterol in the inside of the arteries, which can then lead to heart disease and stroke. The other lipoprotein is high-density lipoprotein. It's much smaller, it still has cholesterol in its core, but it has several different types of particles on the surface. Um, and this is sometimes known as good cholesterol. It transports cholesterol back to the liver where it's broken down, ready to be removed from the body. Now, modern analyzers can measure these individual levels of lipoproteins, so we can get HDL and LDL levels in the blood. And they can also measure the apolipoproteins on the surface, which can be a better count of the number of particles in the blood. And analyzers can measure these all on the same sample. It takes about 30 minutes and it only uses about 1% of our total sample volume. I've talked about two lipoproteins, but there are actually lots of other particles that are important when we're thinking about cholesterol storage, transport and removal. And so I'll now pass back to Andy, who can talk about how new technologies can give even more information on cholesterol carrying particles. There you go, Andy. Catch. Thanks, Sarah. I even caught it. That was a first. Right. As technology has got better and things get more and more advanced, there are other, more improved ways of analysing samples. So, for example, we just quickly told you about HD and LDL and the fact that the analysers are doing one at a time, one after another. We've recently purchased a new piece of equipment called a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer that will allow us to do multiple readings or multiple tests all in one go at one time. So in this case, it would do 120 different measurements on one sample in one go, not one after another, after another, after another. Magnetic nuclear resonance spectrometry works like this. You place your sample in a really strong magnetic field. Right? The field is about a thousand, thousands and thousands times more powerful than the US magnetic field. And this is represented by the magnet here. Okay. When you put your sample into the magnetic field, all of the hydrogen protons in that sample try to align themselves up with the magnetic field. And this is represented by the compass needle here. Okay. What we then do is we then blast the sample with radio waves, which is going to be represented by this rotary mixer here. So when we blast them with the rotary mixer, or turn the rotary mixer on and blast the sample with radio waves, you'll see that the needle starts to vibrate. Exactly the same thing happens with the hydrogen protons in the magnet. This is the resonance part of nuclear magnetic resonance. The samples, because they are trapped and are vibrating, gain more energy. So when we stop the blasting with radio frequencies, the sample 
relaxes back to its original energy state, and that releases that energy, which is what we can detect. Okay, so when the energy releases, yeah, every hydrogen atom that's in that molecule releases energy slightly differently depending on what it's attached to. If we have a quick look here, depending on what the hydrogen is attached to depends on this type of signal that we get. So for example, the one that you can see there is the hydrogen in blue is attached indirectly to two other hydrogens and that will give a three peaks like that. Because we can, every hydrogen gives off slightly different energy, yeah, we can work out every molecule has a unique fingerprint. So that when we put our sample in there and blast it with, blast it with energy and we get our spectrum back, we get a really complicated spectrum like this. And this is a spectrum of plasma. Okay? The lipid part, which is there and there, are the cholesterols that we've been talking about. And what we use is we use a computer to work out what every little peak is and work out what the sample, what's in our sample. That's how it works. It's a very complicated, but also incredibly powerful system to use. So what do we do with the information that the NMR magnet gives us? In our large 30,000 people studies, we'll have some people that have heart disease and we'll have some people that don't. So what we do is we compare the results that we get for those people that have it and those people that don't and look for differences. Those differences could be things like particle size, the type of particle, you know, is HDL as important as we think it is? Is LDL as bad as we think it is? It, it could be different types of cholesterol particle that we've not explained about today that could be important and that might lead medicine on in the future so you know we might find something new and that will be allow us to improve the medicine that we have now so that's what we use the nmr for i hope you enjoyed this little demonstration and thank you very much for watching bye